So for a while now, I've been racking my brain about flight envelope limitations when it comes to paramotor gear, paragliders, and then the frames themselves. So I put my thinking cap on and grabbed a few cups of coffee. Darn geese, leaving the cove. Grabbed a few cups of coffee and I put together some thoughts. It's my opinion that manufacturers of the wings and frames and trikes and quads need to provide us with a little bit more guidance than they have been historically when it comes to what the limitations are for G's, for speed, some of the other factors that affect the corners and the edges of flight envelopes. my grandbaby this morning. She's seven pounds and three ounces. And my wife cut me loose and said, go to the fly-in. What a deal. Man, she's so beautiful. Woo. Congratulations, Colin and Samantha. Well, enough about me. So four decades ago, when I started to make the transition from private pilot to commercial pilot, I was introduced to a lot of charts and planning and performance data that I wasn't previously aware of. As is typical in life, the more you learn, the more you realize there's a lot you didn't know or that you had a simplified understanding of to begin with. Believe me, I'm not looking to do that with paragliding. As you can see from this chart, you can quickly delve deep enough into aviation performance to suck the fun right out of it. But if you bear with me for just another second or so here, I'll try to illustrate how this may have an application for paramotoring. Several decades ago, some manufacturers chose to represent the edges of their flight envelope data that they wanted pilots to understand graphically. Others did it with just raw data. I had always argued that two-dimensional charts weren't good enough to fully convey all of the things that define the limitations of an aircraft and its abilities well enough, especially when you got into high-performance jet airplanes. Over time, the FAA stepped in and said that they wanted to give a more simplified understanding, and they generated some charts in the last decade or so that really helped. In recent years, this chart has begun appearing in FAA publications and documents. It's referred to as a VG chart because it compares velocity on the lower axis and g-loading on the vertical axis on the left-hand side. It's meant to be a general chart. Although it's got some specific data points and plots on it, it's not intended to represent any specific aircraft, but rather to convey exactly what the edges of a flight envelope should be defined by and then they put this out there for the manufacturers to further codify it and put their own specific numbers with the chart so that the charts all seem to convey the same type of information just using different data points specific to each airplane. So I don't want to get wrapped up in specific numbers, but there are a few plots on this chart, the data that's being depicted by this chart for this general concept that we need to understand. First is this red vertical line here. It speeds above that we're flying, speeds below that, the wing is not making enough lift to fly. Now you'll notice that this particular theoretical airplane here is being depicted as being able to operate at zero G's and even into the negative. In other words, outside maneuvers or inverted flight. Well, we know we can't push a string. That's certainly not us. So our paramotor chart is not going to contain any data down below this 1G line, or maybe a little bit below the 1G line, but certainly not very far because operating there is risky and could cause an immediate collapse of the wing. You'll also notice, or at least you should, these orange and red areas of the chart over here on the right that indicate structural damage and then ultimately structural failure. 
And you'll see that by following the chart out, there's two ways to get there. One is through raw speed. With just simply going fast enough, you can reach the point of structural failure on most airplanes. The other way to get there is through G-loading. And you don't necessarily have to be at the absolute fastest speed to still get into structural damage or structural failure by loading up and pulling a lot of Gs. And this is actually pretty typical. Four, four and a half is a utility category airplane. And until you get into fighter aircraft specifically designed to hold and handle a lot of Gs or maybe exhibition aerobatic airplanes, four, four and a half Gs is about the limit for the average typically constructed aircraft. So the third and probably the most important concept from this chart that I'd like to see manufacturers get on board with providing us a little more data and feedback from is this line that runs from the normal stall speed to the maneuvering speed right here, the accelerated stall speed, and in particular, this point right here. Okay, so a little bit of discussion about that. As we load up an aircraft, it will eventually stall simply from the G loading, reaching that critical angle of attack, and relieve the flight pressures on the wing and the airframe up to a certain point, and that point moves into the structural damage range at speeds where the airplane or the aircraft or the wing won't stall before it exceeds its design limits. This is the number that I really, really would like to see all paramotor equipment manufacturers put out there. So how do we find this number? Well, typically it's done by destructive testing. I'm not suggesting that every wing manufacturer needs to go out there and test a wing to destruction, but certainly the cost of doing so for swing arms or hook-in points isn't really so much that a small sample at least couldn't be made or even some data derived from typical engineering of what components of this thickness or this design should be able to withstand. We really haven't been given much to go on here. Of course we've all seen these test videos where these engineers stand around and load up these wings until they fail and that validates the models. That's not really what I'm asking the paramotor manufacturers to do. I'm just looking for some data. So just two more points. Firstly, it's very difficult for us to control the high-end speed of our glider. You pretty much have to maneuver and dive or build up energy through subsequent maneuvers linked one after another to get to the high end of the speed where we'd even possibly get to the structural speed limit of our gliders. Secondly, if we could get the manufacturers to say, hey, this particular glider has a 1,000 pound load limit, period. A 220 pound pilot is going to get there with significantly fewer G's than a 160 pound pilot. And if you add in all the other variables like gear and fuel that we all choose on our own, how much to carry of each, you can see the quagmire that I'm asking the manufacturers to address but I would still like to see some hard data. In any event, I had a real nice time at the uh, Soar the Shore flying, and I'll leave you with some footage of that. Let me know what you think about my thoughts on loading up paramotors. Hello there, buddy. Oh, look at the deer. Oh, my. There's a hundred deer in that field. part of the world were now I know uh, they eased back into the trees they heard me talking oh no they didn't there they are hello ladies hello sir that is one nice big mature buck Woo! man look at that monster